Hi everyone, welcome to the brown bag. Before we start, do we have any announcements? If we don't have any announcements, then Dragana, please take it away. Okay, so um, this isn't exactly your traditional brown bag, uh, research brown bag. It's more one that's related to teaching. I was asked to talk about the online exams that we administer for uh, Intro Psych and to talk about how the lockdown browser works. Uh, so the goal here is to try and describe much of that. So um, I'm going to be talking about uh, setup of online exams um, in terms of preparing pilot, the design of online exams, things to consider, and how the lockdown browser works and what it is. So a couple of disclaimers to start with. Um, I am not an expert in all things pilot, but I have been using it for quite some time, and I'm not going to spend time talking in detail about how to actually make a quiz in pilot. I'm going to be talking um, primarily about advantages and disadvantages of online testing, and there's lots of them, lots of disadvantages, and I'm sure it'll uh, foster some conversation um, and potential debate. Uh, the importance of preparing students for that process of taking an exam online, the importance of the test design, and the logistics of the lockdown browser and respondus monitor. So these two things um, that take, took me a long time to figure out what's what and what these names mean. Um, the lockdown browser basically is something that locks the exam screen and prevents internet browsing. The other part of this is the respondus monitor. Uh, another way of thinking about it is that it's a webcam proctoring. Basically, it's a video record of the face and eyes or whatever's within the uh, computer screen and also has uh, automated flagging of suspicious activity that you can review after an exam if you're concerned about uh, cheating. And I'll show you some examples of those towards the end. Um, I, I want to make sure people recognize that online exams are not perfect. And so while I'm going to argue strongly for them for my purposes, um, I understand that they are not perfect and that we need to think about them as works in progress. Um, as we as we proceed through this, I think um, I'm glad Scott's here too and Deb because I, I think one of the one of the big things that's going to become important um, if we're going to go to more online exams and um, improve their administration, it's going to be um, increased support on the technical side, on technology side. So those are my disclaimers, and this is based. This here is basically the outline of my talk. Advantages, disadvantages, importance of preparing students, importance of test design, and then the logistics of the lockdown browser and respondus monitor. So what are the advantages of online testing? Well, I think for me, it's particularly advantageous for large class sizes. And the feature that I like the most about it is the ability to scramble questions and answers for each test taker. So each student's taking a different test. I don't have to make three different versions of the test to pass around a classroom and make sure people um, distribute them in a particular way. I also don't have to um, spend all that time and money on the copying, right? All that paper uh, that can get uh, wasted. I think that another advantage of online tests is the flexibility in uh, administration time and place. This is, uh, you know, students can take this at home. They can take it in the library. Um, more, most recently, I've even been in the classroom during class time and said, come be in the classroom. Uh, take it in this quiet, quiet space if you'd like. Um, so time, they can take it um, anywhere they want it and they can take it within a certain range of time. So what we typically do for Psych 1010 is offer the exam between 7 a.m and midnight. And I, I noticed that some people really appreciate that. A couple of students commented that they just, 
they're better in the afternoon. So if they could wait, even though their class is scheduled in the morning, if they could just wait until afternoon to take the test, they're in a better place um, for that kind of focus or attention that's needed. The other thing is that it's uh, helpful, I think, for that group of, of, of disability students that um, disabled students through the uh, Office of Disabilities who need extended test taking time. So for them, they have to get with a traditional paper test, they have to schedule a time that they can go in and take the test so that they have one and a half or two times a class period to be able to take it. I can make those adjustments online in pilot and the student can then take that test uh, when it works for them. Just to give you a, a sense, uh, intro psych, uh, I have a little over 300 students, but I have 26 students who are registered with ODS. And if these 26 students all have to go to ODS and schedule to take this exam, I had a student the other day asking me if it was okay if she took the test six days later. And I texted back and I said, well, is there a reason you can't take this test on your computer at home sooner? And so, and, and she was like, oh yeah, I can. And so I think that that is another um, feature that I like about this, being able to get all of those tests done. I think that having online testing or quizzing, uh, it doesn't have to be exams, it could be quizzes, uh, facilitates being able to quiz frequently and assess frequently. So we give, you know, chapter quizzes every week. They get automatically scored and transferred to the gradebook. I don't have to really look at them. Um, some of the uh, features that uh, help with this, um, obviously it depends on the question type, multiple choice questions get um, scored right away. There is the option of, of other question types, in which case you may have to go in and manipulate it um, directly, which can work with smaller class sizes, not necessarily with big class sizes. Uh, also, when you're setting up quizzes, you can have questions drawn from question pools. So you can you can put in a handful of related questions and then have it draw different questions for different students or for randomly draw from these question pools as it's um, being administered. You can give the students feedback right away. You can wait and give them feedback a little bit later. Um, that is also something that Steve Gabbard and uh, Craig Vicchio started with intro psych. They didn't want students who did really well in the morning to then go and help a friend who was struggling in the afternoon. So they withheld the information about how the student did until the next day. I I'm not sure if that matters and, and we'll, we can talk about kind of my opinions on some of some of those things as we move on, but that's another one of the advantages that I see. Um, you can also have the quizzes uh, students have multiple opportunities on some of the lower stakes quizzes, which is really, I think, helpful to promote learning. So the students will take a quiz. They don't they'll f identify what they are weak in. They can go back and study up on it and come back and retake the quiz and the score that gets saved can be the highest of those two. It can be an average. There are different ways of setting the system up for that. For smaller class sizes, you can still use short answer and essays. They'd be typed and they'd be a little bit more legible. I know that for me, at least uh, a lot of times just being able to interpret the answer is a challenging thing on some of those tests. Okay, um, I should say that I am comfortable with people interrupting and asking questions if you want along the way. I'm kind of spewing out a bunch of information and then um, there'll be, I think, quite a bit of room for uh, discussion and conversations as we move through it. So those were the advantages and here are the disadvantages. The there is a slight technological hurdle. I don't know if my uh, Psych 1010 TAs would, would think it's a bit more than a slight technological hurdle, um, but I will definitely talk about that um, next. There also is still the potential for cheating, and that's that's the thing that people are most concerned about with online testing. 
And yes, uh, the potential for che cheating still exists, but I'd like to argue that it can be reduced with um, the question and answer scrambling that I just talked about as, as one of the advantages. I think that it can be reduced, and I'm careful, I'm not saying eliminated, reduced with the use of lockdown browser and webcam proctoring. The other name for that is the Respondus Monitor. I also think cheating can be reduced by giving a narrow time limit in terms of the number of questions and how much time you're allotting for the test. Um, I think I'll get into that a little bit more later, so I'll, I'll save that. And I think it can be reduced with the question quality. Uh, if you're, if you are using multiple choice questions, either have some question pools or think about how you write your multiple choice questions. And some of the things that we've um, been working on is uh, using very applied type questions so that students really need to think uh, about their answers. And I think I'm going to address all those things a little bit more in just a minute. The goal being to make it difficult for the student to search the internet and to contact friends. Um, it's not impossible, but the idea is to make it more difficult or to make them uncomfortable, right? Uh, you're, you're watching them, you are asking them to do things um, and hopefully it's a bit of a deterrent. And that's how, that's how the respondents people refer to it. They refer to it as a deterrent uh, to cheating. I, I do want to note that I discovered this year with from ODS that, uh, that there are some text to speech readers that might require you to disable the lockdown browser. Um, in that case, you make arrangements with ODS for the student to take their exam there on the premises, which I think they may need to do anyway because they may need a personal assistant while they're taking the test. Any questions so far? I laid it all out there and now I'm going to go into detail. Uh, the, un the other disadvantage that I see, I like to be in the room when my students are taking tests from the perspective that you know, I, I always tell them I'm not testing them. Remember, I have intro test anxiety. The number of students with test anxiety in my 22 years here at Wright State um, has grown tremendously. And uh, I don't like seeing a student get stuck on a question on the test and then hand in a blank test. Um, so if I can help them get over that hurdle, if I can help them through that one challenging question that for whatever reason is causing them to go blank on everything, um, I like to be able to do that. Um, and the way I got a little bit around that this past week was to be to say that I'll be in the classroom during class time. You can come and take your test here, bring your laptop uh, and take it here. And I had a couple of students take advantage of that. I had a couple of students the next day say they wish they had. So um, both of those things have occurred. All right, so what are the technological hurdles? Well, they're not insurmountable, but they are, the, but the important part there is that you have to prepare the students. They have to, have to, have to disable pop-up blockers on their computer. And that is the first and foremost, most important thing. We spend three weeks answering, re re replying to emails saying, did you disable your pop-up blocker? Um, so somehow conveying that message early on and very clearly is very important. The lockdown browser that we're talking about does not work on iPads. So they cannot use an iPad to take the test. It does not work on Chromebooks. And many of the students are coming from K K-12 schools with Chromebooks. It does not work on a Chromebook. Ironically, however, the best browser to use is Chrome or Firefox, not Microsoft Edge, not Safari. And so I think this part also causes a lot of confusion because I'll say the best browser to use is Chrome and they just assume they can use their Chromebook and then they go to try and take the quiz or test or whatever and they're unable to. So these are some of, but we know these things. We put them in the syllabus. We talk about them ahead of time. And 
it's just for you guys with smaller classes, I think you can convey this much message more easily uh, than, than we're conveying to a very large class. So how can we prevent some of the tech, technological hiccups? Well, I would highly recommend that you assign some kind of low stakes quiz early in the semester that requires the download of this lockdown browser software. We did a syllabus quiz, but it it was they had to use the lockdown browser because it means they have to download the software. They have to figure out whether kind of computer they have or don't have. They have to figure out the pop up blockers. They have to get it all working on this low stakes assignment so that come exam day. As I tell them, they don't spend 3 hours getting all frustrated with the technology and then are too stressed out to take the exam. So, um, so trying to make them do this ahead of time. The other thing that I'm going to show you here in a moment is that you actually can make the big exam or the big lockdown browser assignment contingent on a smaller assignment. Uh, it can be some kind of pre-test or pre-quiz like I'm talking about, or it can even just be a particular type of homework assignment or discussion. You can use other features of Pilot and use them to set up your contingency uh, for letting the students access the main exam. So you want to give yourself plenty of time for problems to arise and for students to have an opportunity to deal with them. I I think that we're probably going to need to go to the point of, of making some kind of video to help the students uh, set up their computers ahead of time. We, like I said, the online exams is still a bit of a work in progress, getting all of the, the little details in place, but that's probably something we're going to try and do soon. Here's how you set up the contingency. Again, this is pro most relevant to those uh, people who are using Pilot on a regular basis. Um, you go into the quiz to edit it. You go into the restrictions tab and you come down here where it says release conditions, create and attach release conditions. And then you it'll take you into another screen. And for example, when you go to select condition type, I selected a completed quiz attempt. And that completed quiz was one that required lockdown browser. Um, I selected the quiz. You can also let them try more than once. So if they, um, you know, tried to get into this exam, but hadn't done the quiz, you can let them go back. They'll, they can go do the quiz and try coming in again. So you can um, you can have different settings here as well. And so I think I think that's primarily what I have for preparing the students, kind of getting them set up, making them understand that that, that testing is going to be online. And here are some things that you need to think about. What you'll see when we get to, when I get to the end of my presentation, I'm going to try and show you some of the videos from the recent. Um, from the recent exam, and I think there are uh, more things that are going to have to go into this preparation process that we'll need to talk about and we can we can. It, it will make more sense when you see these videos that I show you. Hey, uh, Dragana. Yes, this Scott. Is Scott. Um, so I, I don't know if this is the appropriate time to, to talk about this and if you want to leave it till later, that's fine. In thinking about utilizing this and I'm not thinking about negative here, but would it be interesting to make taking, for example, a midterm contingent on getting a certain grade on a lower you stakes can do that. quiz? Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> and with that, and, and let's say they're allowed several attempts, is there a way that you know of while it will um, you know, randomly select questions from a, a, uh, 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 you know, a bin full or a, a, a database. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to do it without replacement? That is, I would like to have it so that you don't get the same, you know, you don't even have a chance of getting the same question that you saw before again, right? Because in the past, in particular, I are, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, uh, 
um, blocking on what, you know, that we have to qual, you know, for the I or B, we have to do those, you know, qualifications. Right. So those, you can take more than once, and quite frankly, you get the same questions. Same questions over and over again. Yeah. So it, it, do you know if that's a possibility? Um, that I, would make me feel happier, by the way. About yeah. You know what? We can take a look. I, may, and again, may, this might be reserved to later. Yeah, but. no, I noticed there's some chat. Com the reason I stopped is there's some chat coming through and I realize I don't have it open. Um, but what I'm thinking is that uh, we can take a look uh, when I go into my pilot a little bit later. Let's take a look at that quiz tool um, and just take a look in the question pools and see what some of the options are. Because I know okay. there's random and I know there's something else, but I don't know if there's any way of guaranteeing that there's no repetition. Right. So that it's not idea. random without replacement. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Doesn't, I, I don't remember seeing something like that, but that's a really interesting point. Yeah. I do, do I always know? warn the students that they may not get all the same questions. So when they go and study, um, if they're just studying the ones they missed, they might be in danger because other questions might show up. And so um, I, I can tell them that. Dragana, if you don't mind, can uh, Riley ask his question that he typed in the chat? Yes, please. Go ahead, Randy. Yeah, hi, Dragana. I was just I was just curious at like the university strategic level. If you know, like, are there any other are there conversations right now of like pushing for, you know, classes activities to to stay more on online in certain ways or to get us more back in person? And I also wonder too, like if there are other departments you know at the college or university who are having similar conversations about about testing that we might be able to you know share ideas or collaborate on to make sure that you know there's not like a disconnect if that makes sense yeah so really um you know deb will probably answer this question even better i'll tell you what what i know right right at the moment we all turn to cats or what used to be CTL for this kind of guidance. And so any kind of cross departmental uh, collaboration would happen through us being able to meet people that way or be, be instructed uh, to reach out to people that way. I think, in my opinion, we're getting a bit of a mixed signal from administration, right? We were asked to have a certain number of office hours to make sure we were starting to show up back on campus and be in person. Uh, and right. yet there is, uh, I believe, a push for more and more online programming in part because that is um, a, a demand in the market. Um, and it's interesting because I have conversations with students who are in my in-person class all the time. And I had a couple of students here the other day who said they couldn't take it online. They have to come in. They need the in-person. So, you know, we're having a lot of conversations about whether certain students are self-selecting for online versus in-person. And I, I don't know where, I think the university is pushing for online, but I don't know where that's going to go because I think there's pushback. So, Deb, yes. A couple comments on this point. Um, first of all, for those of you who are on campus, I'm I'm at home because I'm, I'm in Zooms all day. <laughs> um, uh, so, Trish just texted me that a, a student um, has committed suicide in the library like just a few minutes ago and Trish has apparently an upset student in her office at the moment and the library is closed off. So this discussion is highly salient that we're having, which is <clears throat> we need students need to be on campus engaged. The university is engaged in a multi pronged approach to facilitate student success and well being and survival. <laughs> um, and so I think moving forward, we will have a mix of online and in person classes. Um, I think there's there are certain advocates on campus of something that is uh, truly or what do they call it high flex. Um, I'm not 
sure all of us will ever get on board completely with that. The notion of high flex being um, <clears throat> you have a class, you have a classroom that can seat those students or a percentage of those students and you give the students 100% of choice in whether they're going to attend that day in person or virtually or listen to it asynchronously or, or whatever. Um, that is extremely difficult to manage pedagogically. Um, however, uh, we have equally hard pushes to increase the number of online classes and our department actually is uh, much better, better off on that dimension than other departments within COSM. So the rest of COSM is looking at us. So to figure out how to do this, there are pockets in other departments like Pat Sonner would be one um, who are all over this and who are trying desperately to figure out the best paths forward with this. <clears throat> so there's a huge push for uh, more online offerings. There is similarly a huge push for engaging in-person offerings. So, so it's going both ways. And there's a huge push to have more in-person um, social and networking and um, activities on campus so that our students actually feel connected and as a part of a community. So um, I'll stop there. Okay. Oh my goodness. I'm Thank you. Sort of for... processing the other thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's part of the reason I stopped sharing. I decided we wanted to see each other's faces for a minute. Um, I think that in terms of the high flex, I, I think what I'm finding is that um, we do need to have some flex and it actually ends up helping me in the end uh, because I have 325 students and I have 10 or 15 of them every day who don't make it to class, whether it's because their car broke down or they didn't wake up or the whatever, and they're asking me, what did we do in class today? Well, the best way to tell them what did we do to class in class today is to send them to a recording of a class. Um, and so I am finding myself doing some of that. Um, and I think that's, I, so a huge, because of course I'm apparently on every university committee that exists at this moment that sort of happened by accident. Stop laughing at me, Scott. <laughs> Scott and Trish and Dragana and, and Pam Garbrick are probably on a similar number of committees all across campus. It's keeps you hopping. Um, a huge push. I forgot where I was going because I was just thinking about all my committee assignments. Oh, rats. The the recordings of lectures. Oh yes, yes. <clears throat> a huge universal push across the university is meeting the students where they are. And so the if so, if you have a student who's working 30 hours a week or 40 hours a week and um, they're supposed to come to your class, but sometimes their boss schedules work on those days, the 100% expectation of the university is that we will figure out a way and the, the, to make sure that the student can get the content they need, whether that's in person or through recordings or whatever. Um, and that, that the faculty, including the GTAs, with supervision from the faculty, of course, um, are going to need to become much more creative than we ever were before in terms of figuring out what, what is the obstacle that's causing this student in this class to currently have a DF, uh, D or an F or withdraw and figuring out a path with forward with the students so that they can actually succeed in the class. So yes, you know, being flexible. So the days of, and, and the university is still battling um, sort of the, uh, I don't know, the curmudgeons on, on the faculty who are sort of, you know, it's their responsibility. Uh, they have to show up and if they fail, that's their deal and they have to meet standard. And the university is no. We, these are the students, we've made a commitment, we've taken their tuition dollars, we will do everything we can think of to help those students be successful. Not lower our standards, but be flexible 
so that the students can get the content they need and demonstrate their competence with it. So we are going there. there we are absolutely heading in this direction. We will end up with um, an online path to the BA. We will go there. We will figure out the best ways of reducing. We will never be able to eliminate cheating in person or online, but we're going to try to find best ways of delivering instruction and testing. I'll be quiet. Thank you, Deb. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, and, and I, I find the, the only challenge, you know, with meeting the students where they are, or the big challenge that I find, and, and I think my experience is going to be very different than all the rest of you, right, it is the sheer number I have to deal with. Um, you know, I spend three or four hours uh, on email each day answering the kinds of questions that just make you roll your eyes. And if there were a way to somehow prevent those questions, I think these students would just be in a much better place earlier and sooner. And so, you know, there's a lot of conversation that has to go on about how to prepare them better. Um, so let me move on with this and then I'm sure we, I, I think we'll trigger other similar questions as we move on. Um, Steve Gabbard and Craig Vicchio gave a lot of thought to test design when we went online with COVID. And some of the things that they instituted um, that we're still using that we think might help reduce cheating a bit. Um, the first one is that question number one is essentially an honor code question. It's a true or false. You know, I, I recognize that I'm following the rules. I'm not using my textbook. I'm blah, 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 blah. You know, it's all it really does is make them think about the fact that, oh, yeah, I'm not supposed to cheat. Um, clearly, it doesn't do anything, but maybe for those students who are a little bit more conscientious, it just makes them feel a little bit more uncomfortable when they do or if they do. Um, the other part of it is that um, we try to limit the time given to the test and at the moment i don't think it's a very good time limit we're gonna i think i think we're moving to reducing it but at the moment it's 60 questions in 80 minutes um i think we need to go to 60 questions in 60 minutes but i'll tell you why maybe it's not a good idea and that has to do with the fact that these are applied questions they are very wordy in fact i got a complaint yesterday about the questions are just too wordy and if any of you have ever talked to craig vicchio it is right along his angle of conversation. It's just the way he talks. And so not only are they wordy as in they need to be their examples, but they also, in terms of the language he uses, they take time for the students to read. And our students have reading difficulties. And so um, this is one of the problems. You have some students who finish the test in half an hour, and you have other students who really are still trying to read the test um, towards the end of the time limit. Um, how we can't necessarily adjust the time per student, uh, but this would be the one, this is one place where you can try to squeeze them a bit, uh, and, and, and limit the number of amount of time that they have to finish a certain number of questions. The design of the, of the questions is to be written in the form of examples that get at deeper understanding beyond terms and definitions. And I'm actually going to go into my little pseudo brown bag quiz where I grabbed a couple of questions from our last exam to show you. <clears throat> so here's question number one. I agree and understand that I'm not able to use any resources to help me during this test, including but not limited to internet, book, notes, or another person. Uh, true or false, right? And, you know, they get a point for doing it because the system requires us to put some kind of value on there, but it's really minimal. And then we have questions like this one here. Uh, Brian is an avid, avid reader. After reading a suspense novel by Stephen King, he reads a book with a similar plot written by another author, Dean Kuntz. 
Brian finds that his memory of the Kuntz novel is interfering with his memory of the King novel that he had read earlier. Brian is experiencing blank. The thing about this is that you can search Stephen King, you can search Dean Kuntz, and you're going to get a whole bunch of information about their books, but you're not going to get information about pruning, retroactive interference, retrograde amnesia, or proactive interference, right? And so how do you search this question? Um, it's difficult. Um, De Dragana? Yes. I would, argue, <clears throat> I would argue you search based on the answers. You could. But then you're going to get examples of them and you're still going to have to know how to apply it to this. And but you certainly would get close, way closer. Okay. Yep. I mean, that's just. I'm going to show you in a minute. Okay. My class average is a 59. <clears throat> no, I think that's, that's <laughs> probably the biggest argument. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, you could. And, and maybe some people are, right? Maybe if I'm smart enough to do that, I would not have to do that. I would hope. I would hope. Um, just to give you, I mean, I, I really didn't necessarily mean to read all of these for you. Here's the simplest, simplest one that we have, which activity relies mostly on procedural memory. But you still need to really consider, you know, what the options are and what the other types of memory are and, and make sure you're sure about your response. Does anyone want me to leave this up here longer so you can read some more of these or are you okay? All right, so I will go back to my presentation for a minute. I'm just curious, Dragon, have you had like a lot of students who who've complained about the time lim limit or who have just said like, there's no way I can get through all of these questions. No, no one's actually complained about the time limit. Um, some of this, but they've complained about the wordiness of the questions. Okay, gotcha. Uh, Dragana, just a quick comment. Uh, these are great questions, by the way. Uh -huh. um, how difficult are they to grade? Well, remember, these are multiple choice, so I don't touch them. The computer oh, does yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. Right? Okay, so they are all multiple choice. Okay. They're all multiple choice. So, again, that's because of the class size. Mm -hmm. Right, so that I don't have to go in and hand grade or make my poor TAs do any more hand grading than they are already doing for labs. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. But that's why the design of the questions is so important, because they are the multiple choice questions. Now, remember, I'm talking about large classes, and a lot of what I'm talking about here is applying to the large class sizes. With smaller class sizes, you can do a lot more, and you can be more, you can use essay questions, and you can use matching and ordering and all kinds of other interesting varieties um, to make up your exam, uh, but you would need to be more engaged in the grading process. So, um, with that test design, now, now, now we're getting to, again, we're talking about how we can reduce cheating, right? We talked about reducing cheating by how we design the questions, the fact that the questions are scrambled, and now we're down to using the lockdown browser and respondus monitor. Um, basically, you write your quiz, you get it all ready. You enter, and I'll show you this in a minute, you enter the quizzes area of your pilot, and then you enter uh, a tab that says lockdown browser on it. The reason I have this image here is to just let you know that once we do that, and I'm going to show you some of this, there's all kinds of literature, pre-prepared PDFs for us to send out to our students. Uh, pre-prepared, and here's an instructor quick start guide. There are videos and tutorials. And so for those of you who think you might like to try this out, um, I'm giving you kind of the introductory push, but all of the resources are right there. And I will show you that in just a moment. So you'll go into the quizzes and exams area at the top of your pilot page. And then when you get in there at the very right, you'll see this thing that says lockdown browser. And really, you don't want to go in there until you have designed your quiz, because what you need to do basically is link the lockdown browser to your already established quiz. Does that make sense? So here we are in the lockdown browser page. You'll notice that at the very top, 
uh, if you're new to responders proctoring, see this intro video, blah, 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 more tips. Basically, this tip screen changes each time I go in here. And so they're constantly providing tips for what to do. Then you have the main lockdown browser tab here. You've got several different tabs. You start out in your dashboard. Your dashboard lists all of your quiz type assignments. You have getting started videos, video tutorials. And when you go over here to guides and supports, that's where you would get the downloadable PDFs that you can also share with students. So if you notice my brown bag quiz here at the moment has uh, no lockdown browser required, no proctoring or video webcam required, right? As soon as you link it, you'll get this tag that you see here with my exam one, requires respond as lockdown browser plus webcam. You can choose to have just the lockdown browser and no webcam, okay? Um, I don't think you can do webcam without lockdown browser, but uh, but you can choose to not use the webcam because I know there were some concerns about privacy and we can talk about, I actually do have something on that as well. So your dashboard, there's the brown bag quiz before it got linked. And so now you're going to go to this drop down arrow over here on the quiz page. And when you drop down, it'll say settings. And this is grayed out. It's not even an option yet, but you'll, you'll get to settings and then settings will pull up this lockdown browser settings. The default is that it is not required. Don't require lockdown browser. Okay. So you want to select require respond as lockdown browser. I'm going quickly. So if people want me to slow down, tell me. And then it opens up more information. So now I've clicked on require over here. And now you have the option of setting a password for the access to the exam. Um, I don't usually do that. You don't want to get another hurdle for the students to get into the exam. And then you've got the bottom part that asks you if you want proctoring. If you want web proctoring, you would you would click on requires re respondus monitor automated proctoring for this exam. This is new. They now have a live proctoring via Zoom and Microsoft Teams. So for your smaller classes, you could do this, make everyone, you know, put their cameras on and you can sit here and watch them while they take their test. Um, I think that's an interesting new option um, for us. This is the other part that comes up when you select the webcam proctoring. Now you get this chart here this is the startup sequence that the student will see. The student will be required to do to 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 or it, it will trigger a webcam check. So the system will check and see if their webcam is working or not. The system will also do a facial detection check because it's it's trying to make sure that they are there and they are in the view. If you want, and these are all toggle toggle options, you can make sure they see additional instructions. You can make sure they get to read the guidelines and tips. You can require a, a photo snapshot of them at the beginning so that you can see if somebody else takes their place halfway through. You can do um, require them to show their ID card to prove that they are who they say they are. You know, they have to place their ID card really close. And you can require them to do an environment check, in which case they have to take their computer and kind of rotate it around the room and show what is what and who are around them. There are, in terms of the facial detection, there is the option to prevent students from starting the exam if their face cannot be detected. And there is um, the option to notify students during the exam if their face cannot be detected. Um, one of the students today told me that what happens to her when she um, steps away is that the screen goes blank. Um, so it basically stops the test. They can't take the test during that time period. So I don't actually know what it looks like exactly on their side. That's something we would sometime maybe have to do. Um, with one person, 
you know, setting up a test and then we'd kind of take it as a in student mode and see how it worked somewhere else. So these are options you have. In terms of the privacy issues, I know Marty has raised this a couple of times and, and, and I know we're we're all sensitive to it. This is from the respondents page. Um, they're very careful to say that, you know, they don't require students to register with their we website. Um, they don't pro um, they don't require the students to put in emails or passwords. They don't drop in on students during the exam. They don't access student files and so on and so forth. Um, and then the things that they do do, like the webcam is automatically turned off when the exam is completed, so it doesn't continue uh, recording. Um, the data should be encrypted from start to finish. And all access to the proctor to the proctoring videos has to be done through the learning system. So that's through pilot. So I can't just go somewhere else from home. Um, it's it's always filtered through pilot. So that would mean that only those people who have access to that pilot page can uh, should be able to see it. Any questions or comments? I have a quick question. So mm -hmm. I think you mentioned earlier that when you use the lockdown browser, um, you cannot use uh, the screen reader or audio. Um, is there an option in Pilot to use screen readers when you don't use the lockdown browser? Right, so you disable the lockdown browser and those students can use the text to speech. And my understanding from ODS is that it's certain text to speech readers, and I don't know what that means. I haven't been given that information. Oh, so so it's not a facility provided by pilot is whatever they have on their computer. I believe so. Yes. Use, okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so. Um, again, after you have uh, activated things, you will see this tag added to your um, quiz exam title, and you'll see that this here has turned to required and respondus monitor. Just a reminder that under guides and supports, you can come in and there's a whole set of student instructions. There's instructions for the browser only, for the browser plus webcam, um, and for the live monitoring. So these are things that you can download. It says there are some things in red that can be edited, uh, probably things that are course specific that you would want your students to know. Um, and so they provide you with the instruction materials to share with your students. Um, just, I, I said it already, but just, I find it um, interesting that this uh, instructor live proctoring is available now for, and again, for small classes. I think that's the, that's the key there. You can't really do it with the large classes. Dragana? Yes. So um, the student, they go into pilot and there's a button they click on lockdown browser, and then they can download the lockdown browser from right there. Do they, do they, Download respond is also is it just automatically? So I think it goes together. Yes, and they don't really they don't actually have to click on anything that says lockdown browser. They click on the quiz and the quiz will require them to. Okay, it'll take. You said them. something about they have to download the lockdown browser, but they, they don't. Do. So the first they time do. they enter a quiz that requires it, it'll go through the steps. It'll take them to wherever. It, it walks them through the steps. Yeah. I see. Okay, and the only thing that will prevent them and that will prevent to create snags will be the if they haven't pop disabled up. their pop up blockers. And yeah. so I cannot tell you. Alex <laughs> is here. Preston's here. Mark's here. They can tell you. I, I can't tell you how often we are reminding them. Yeah. To okay. Disable pop up blockers. Um, cats may be tired of us because we keep telling them to go over to cats. <laughs> So after you've given the exam, this is that now you 
click on this down arrow and you have the option of class results and exam stats. Uh, I took this before my students were done. 59 out of the 184 uh, had taken their exam. So you get just the basics. Um, their average was 57. The high was 96. The low was 26. Here's your average duration. It, at, on average, it took students 41 minutes to take this test, although some students did take the whole hour and 20 minutes. Somebody actually managed to finish in 18. Um, I don't know what their score is. That would be interesting to see. Um, so you have some of that data here, some basic data here. But what you really care about are these class results. And <laughs> I kind of hesitate to share some of these with you because I uh, I did go through quite a few of them last night. And it's very clear to me we, we need to make sure we're doing this more systematically. And um, I have to figure out what that means. Um, basically, when you click on class response, uh, results, you will get a chart with all the student names. I've blacked them out for the moment. And at the very top, you'll get your highest priority. The, the ones that the system views as being your highest priority to see. Okay. That means that this student was flagged multiple occasions as their face not being detected in the screen for some reason. And so I'm going to show you now how we can look at those and see why the face may not have been detected. Did they walk away? Are they looking down? What's going on? Um, if you, you can see the date they took and the time they took the exam, you can see their score. So my first reaction when I saw this was, okay, so they, even if they cheated here, they got a 31. Those are not the ones I'm worried about, right? The student I was most worried about was when I got to the 85. Okay, let's see, did this student maybe do well because they cheated? Um, so, so you can filter, you can even filter which ones you go through and look at. Um, and the way you look at them is by pressing this plus sign over here next to their name. So before I proceed and start showing you some, I do want to emphasize that this is my class. We just talked about privacy issues. So if you recognize a face or a name, I just ask you to keep it to yourselves. Um, because I, I'm doing this so that we, that you all see how this system works. Um, and I don't want anyone passing judgment on these students or, or saying anything to them. Okay. Fair. All right. So here is the, an example. When you click over here, now you see the student's video. You see that this student came up as high priority for review got flagged six times, um, and now you see a list over here of the times when the, during the video that those flags occurred. I also have now learned that if you click on this milestones button, you'll also get um, a track record of when they answered each question on the exam. And so you'll have, you know, they answered five questions and after question five, they were missing from the frame or you know whatever that sequence is and i'll show you that in just a minute this is this is a static image just to show you that this is the video here and that we're talking about going to these key spots to see what the student is doing it turns out that this student took her initial image and picture without the mask on and then for some reason she put the mask on and she's in the view the entire time like this, fully in view, but she put the mask on somewhere in the middle or somewhere around the beginning. And so that ended up causing quite a bit of flagging, but you'll see that her eyes are dark. So a lot of what we need now to work on is compliance on the side of the student of giving us decent video records. Um, and. You know, I hate to penalize them for not doing that, but that's going to end up being perhaps some uh, a process that we're going to have to think about or consider. Um, in on the Brightspace website, and Brightspace is the Respondus and Lockdown browser company. They do talk about how video quality does matter. 
Um, some of the big things that I highlighted and noticed that were issues for me were that a common mistake that the students make is that they start out up here while they do everything. I don't, you can't see me, but they start up really close to the camera and then somewhere during it, they start slouching and moving back in their chair. And that change in image uh, will trigger um, will trigger the system to basically flag them and put put a high alert on them. If they're taking the exam in a dark room and they're not well lit, or if they're too backlit, those can be problems as well. So the lighting and the quality of their video. Again, this is where I said this is if we're going to do this kind of thing. We're going to have to really consider uh, what kind of technological support we can provide to our students so that they can, in fact, um, meet the requirements that we're going to need. So I am going to again go into my pilot and show you some examples. We're about to run out of time. I feel bad about this, but I want to show you something. So I go into Lockdown Browser, I come down to my Exam 2, I go into Class Results, and I don't know, I'll pick this student here. If I click on Milestones, as I said, it'll tell you the exam started here, question one is answered here, question four, five, six, seven, and then there's this missing from frame moment. If you click on that, it'll take you to that missing from frame moment. This student was there the whole time, and, and the best I could tell, his eyes were actually in the same, same place the whole time, but you can see the difference. Um, you know, he put his hand up, maybe the lighting changed a bit, I mean, he's still, if you look at him, his eyes are still looking up. He's just getting, they get tired. And then the amount of fidgetiness that get, that you start seeing towards the end um, is pretty remarkable. You get some thumbnails down here. You could just skim the thumbnails like this. Notice this is the student photo, the ID, and then there's there's his whole, kind of, just some some scattered thumbnails to let you see some of his video. I did look at a couple, or I looked at a, quite a few. You can tag over here when you've looked at them. I, I didn't tag all the ones I looked at. I actually had a student who was talking to her roommate the entire time of the test and basically said, oh yeah, well, she, they can hear that uh, we're not talking about the test questions and, oh, but she won't even check anyway. So I wrote her a really nice little email about how I enjoyed her conversation with her roommate. And um, I did check, by the way, and I agree that I don't, I don't really like, I don't care for the um, Ohio State fight song either. And we'll see what kind of reaction I get from her. But I mean, I don't know what else to do, but that student got a 29. So I'm really not, I, mean, I don't expect, I, I think she just doesn't care about the class, right? So, so how you determine whether you're going to act on what you see or what you or, or what do you see um let me grab this person here so this one's really hard for me to determine this student kind of starts out looking down i'm not quite sure what he's looking down at but his eyes are clearly going between something kind of off to the side here and from time to time going to something down. You see, did you see that glance down? So now I have to decide how to handle the situation. And I'll be completely honest, we really haven't done this yet, right? We've looked at the exam scores and said to ourselves, okay, the amount of cheating that might be going on is limited enough that we're not concerned, but moving forward, we, we really do need to address these videos and what we're going to do about them. Right? Um, and so that's kind of where we are at in terms of our evolution with these online exams. Um, let me, I want to, I, 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 so, I, just want to say, I think yeah. the issue is that um, we don't know what he's looking at. We don't know what so, he's looking so at. So what you have are is completely circumstantial. Exactly. Stuff. 
and maybe he's looking at a keyboard. Exactly. Maybe he's doing some kind of weird, exactly. you know, control of the mouse. Then I, you know, I think that all of this would, because I've been on the committee, university committee, where students come, uh, you know, have been accused of cheating or something, and it goes to the university committee because mm -hmm. uh, they want a hearing, and we go to these hearings. This kind of, quite frankly, I look at that, I'm like, I have no idea. I can't tell if they're looking at it. And unlike, just let you know, at that level, um, unlike courts of law, where, um, you know, you need, you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of proof that that they did or didn't. We go by, you know, it, it's it's not necessarily proof, but it's do we have anything that makes us, you know, inclined to say, yeah, they they were doing something wrong or not. But with this evidence, I'm like, I can't make that judgment. Right, and and that's why I'm saying there's got to be some kind of consistency in what the camera is. So they do the environment check and they go around like this. But what I really want to know is what's on the desk, right? And so there needs to be very clear instructional guidance. And you're going to have to, if you're going to do that, then you're going to have to, you know, sample through these and start calling people on it. And you know being difficult during class and reminding them that they're supposed to be checking their environment or else or else and the question is you know are you really what are you going to do you're going to make them take the test again you're going to make them write a paper what is it that you're going to do um, to make them accountable and we're not we're not quite there yet but i have to admit that um for me right now this is the easiest way to administer exams um, the amount of time I spend with just the hand holding on everything else with this class, if I had to also do the extra work around the exams, it would just be a pain in the butt. I mean, I, I've done it. I can do it. I'm just saying that it'd be really nice if we, if there, if we could continue doing this and just really trying to snag the obvious ones. The ones having conversations with their roommate, if they were having a conversation about actual questions, um, that would be. Um, Definitely one to think about. I mean, I think the other issue is, of course, I can show you it's on my desk now. Exactly. But what do you slide and, back in? And yeah. the fact that these, that most webcams, as we just look at, you know, you and the faces of the people in this meeting are not wide angle. Right. Right. So imagine you had a wide angle that not only showed the person, but, you know, everything like straight down from the camera. Around. That would be way better, but quite frankly, you're never going to see that. It's not going to be standard, and we can't start dictating a certain kind of webcam that you must have in order. Right. So, you know, Deb's idea of having uh, rooms that are testing centers on campus. I mean, I, I really think that's going to end up being uh, the better way to do it. But then, how do you do? You know, Riley, you were asking, are we pushing towards online classes? And we are. But I think that we can. I. Th but then you have to do written assignments. You have to grade discussion boards and more, more and more of the kind of uh, grading that can't be cheated, which means you need um, you need the people power to do that. So I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, given that cheating seems to be really hard to prevent, unavoidable. Um, yeah. What about having a multiple choice exam that kind of like how the one in 10, 10 is currently, that's really difficult and really probed understanding, but it's just simply open note and has a time limit such that uh, even an unprepared student goes into it. Oh, the time limit is so constrained that they won't not be able to do well unless they're well prepared. That That's a possibility. I mean, this is a, that that's, that's a testing strategy <laughs> that I know that, um, 
Steve Gabbard even used in uh, well before there was online, well, well before we were having to do online classes and it was in Psych 300. It's like, it's open book, but you know, basically you're not gonna be able to look up everything, right? I mean, there's a time constraint, literally because it was in person and it's gonna be involved. And if you literally are coming there unprepared and have to look up every equation to figure out all these things, you're done. And and he would tell them that he said, but it is open book. And you know, people get this. I, I mean, so in, in my perception class, I give uh my tests have both a matching and an and a multiple choice. But the matching, you know, there are 25 questions and I have 50 possible answers in the answer selection list, and you can use an answer more than once. So there's no, oh, I'm going to do this by process elimination. Basically, I have a gargantuan multiple choice that if you have no idea what the answer is, you are sunk, right? Mm -hmm. And you can't say, oh, I used that one, so I'll mark it off. No, because it could be used again. Right. So, you know, there are testing strategies that work not only online, but also in person that, you know, make it imperative that, people are prepared. Of course, you know, students come in, you know, I say it's a matching and then I tell them, however, and I tell them up right up front, however, here, here's a problem. It's not like, oh, there's 10 questions, 10 answers. I know five of them. I can guess the other five and, you know, I should be able to do pretty well because I've got this process of elimination and I just cross out the ones as I use them. And I tell them, you know, that's not going to work. You basically have to know. <laughs> the answers, but I use it because I like I put pictures that need to be labeled, and right. so either I could just have them labeled or I have this you know matching, which is a whole lot easier. But that's a strategy whether you're doing in person or online testing. Yeah, Riley has a point there about you know students who um, you know you can tell them till you're blue in the face that yes that's not going to help them, but until they take that first test and figure it out. Um, they may not listen. Well, it just se it seems to like if if currently like no one's really complaining about the time limit and they have time to complete the questions, it might just be an issue too of like, you know, with how low the average is is like, I would be worried about making questions even more difficult than they already are. It's like maybe mm -hmm. that's maybe that's just what it is. Is like the difficulty or they're just. They, they're not comprehending these word problems. I mean, it could be a myriad of things, but mm -hmm. I would be worried with making it even more difficult than it already is. But. I, I think the difficulty the 1010 exam could be, uh, if, you, if, you, if you lower the time limit a bit, I think you could probably make it open book and it'd be fine. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of reading, you have to really understand things. It's hard to Google. Um, I'd expect it would work pretty well if you just made it open book. I just uh, loaded time limit. Interesting thing to consider. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. So, Dragona, we're over time, and uh, I see you saw the chat. Do you want to address the other things in the chat, or? Uh, no, I can just say the multiple screens. I've definitely thought about that one because I have multiple screens, and you know, we're talking about. Uh, you know, I I, I was do I was doing a. Um, thesis defense just before this, and I'm looking over this way, and they don't realize that actually I'm looking over here because I've moved them over here. Um, but for all they knew, I was doing some com something completely else, right? Um, but yeah, multiple screens, definitely an issue. Um, you know, a phone propped up on one of those, on a stand, or, you know, I don't know, somebody on the other side of the computer screen. There's so many possibilities. I, yeah, thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Thank you, Dragana. Thank you. You're thank welcome. You. Thanks. Have a good weekend, everyone. Too.